I'm sure there is, but I can't think of anything right now. 260,000. No, it wasn't at the beginning of my when my dad went in. And uh, when I got here, it was me. But air conditioning, oh, yeah. start off by apologizing for my appearance. I uh, have to catch a plane to the left coast for a meeting, so that's why I don't have time to change after class. So I'll be getting up. In fact, I might quit a little bit early because I'm really cutting it tight. Um, to Orange County, to John Wayne. Yeah, it's a nice country. How's that baby doing? Yes, I know. Yeah. Well, I mean, we have a college out there. Uh, Concordia University, Irvine. Um, and they're, they're inaugurating, they just inaugurated their second campus in the Irvine area. They started a nursing school. And they're trying to be distinctively Lutheran um, with you know, some success, I would say. Uh, all right. But he's not in charge of the college. We'll just have to make sure that that's clear. Yeah. All right. So um, let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus Christ, be with us in these days as we reach the end of the church year, that we m might consider our sins, that we might confess faithfully, but also be confident that your return is one that brings us joy and about which we are presently quite confident. Help us then to lift up our heads and see our salvation coming when you come to judge the living and the dead. In your most precious name we pray, amen. Okay, so last week we had gotten partway through the humiliation of Christ in our study, um, and so that's where we'll take up with his death today. What, what page is that for those of you that are in paper? 23, okay, very good. So he died, Romans 8, 34. Jesus Christ, uh, wait, sorry, Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. So he dies a very real death. This isn't a um, spectral death or an appearing death or something like that. Um, so that for Lutherans, it's obligatory to say God died. Who is this man? He's God. What happened to him? He died. Um, now, of course, we'll all scream and yell and say it's impossible for God to die and so on. You're welcome to the screaming and yelling. But the fact is that's the revelation of the Bible, right? It doesn't necessarily fit what we expect God to do or how God to act. Um, and again, this shows us the fact that faith it must be humble in the face of the divine speech and the divine acts, of course, too. All right. Um, he's also buried. Um, we've already seen this 1 Corinthians 15 text. Uh, for I delivered you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried. 
and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and the Twelve, and so on, right? That's how it goes. Um, so, I mean, these are four significant elements. Died, buried, rose, appeared. Those are the four confessional elements there in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, notice that the two most important are died, according to the scripture, and rose according to the scripture, right? The other two elements, appeared and died, are reinforcing to the previous two. So why does Paul say died? I mean, wait, buried, sorry. Why does Paul say buried? Why, what's the big deal about burial? You don't bury live people. Yeah, they're really dead, right? And of course, we have this view, you know, that they're ignorant first century people and so on. They knew dead when they saw it. <laughs> Say again? Yeah, well, you wouldn't. And in this case, of course, God would not let his Holy One see decay. So there's no odor coming from the body of Jesus, which is a little bit odd. Although my guess is that in the process of crucifixion, well, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, okay. Um, so burial emphasizes the reality of his death. Okay. Let me just, yeah. Oh, but they have Genesis through Malachi. Okay, so yeah. That's what he's oh, yeah. Okay. Paul definitely because First Corinthians is probably the first New Testament book written. Before Matthew, Mark, or Luke, we always had, it's at the beginning of the book, obviously they wrote it first. Well, probably not, right? It's not organized by, by time, really, at all, as we've seen. Um, it's organized in, diff in a different way. So 1 Corinthians has to be referring to the Old Testament when it says according to the scriptures. And, and again, as you read the Gospels, all the way through the Gospels are saying, according to Isaiah, according to Jeremiah, according to Moses, according to the Psalms, right? All the way through. The New Testament presumes that the Old Testament's speaking of Christ. And Jesus presumed that too. Now, you can, again, you can disagree with Jesus if you like. The old liberals did this. They said, well, that's impossible. No one could have predicted the coming of the Messiah. Well, of course, God probably could, you know. But the old libs, of course, um, it's a long story, but they just didn't believe that God could do what he said. Okay. And for, one to three, I feel like there's a line where he descended into hell. Well, you're, you're getting ahead of me. Oh. This is a great question. It's coming. Okay. Yeah. The funny thing is that the descent into hell isn't part of his humiliation. It's part of his exaltation, and here's why. So the text that teaches the descent of Christ into hell is 1 Peter 3, 18 and 19. For Christ also suffered once for sins, our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous. He's the righteous one. We're the unrighteous ones. That he might bring us to God, so he's bringing us to God by dying for us, being put to death in the flesh, so it's a real death, but made alive in the spirit, that's his resurrection, in which he proclaimed, went, sorry, went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. So you have a proclamation of the Messiah at his resurrection and probably before his public appearance. So he's raised... Whether or, not, whether or not he appears outside the tomb, you know, when does he cause the, the soldiers to faint, right? We don't know in relationship to this descent. Generally, it's thought that he is vivified, that is, comes alive and descends into hell, and then the stone is rolled away and the, the, the soldiers have their faint. Um, so the question is, what's he doing in hell? The best way to explain it is by a parable. So at the end of the Second Gulf War, just about this time in the year, 
President Bush, part de, um, got on Air Force One and flew to Baghdad. And while he was in Baghdad, he fed Thanksgiving dinner to the troops. So he slung mashed potatoes and gravy. Did President Bush go to Baghdad to serve Thanksgiving dinner? He did not. He went to Baghdad to say, we have put you down, we are the victors, you are the losers, and our head man is safe enough that he can come in here and do something as frivolous as sling mashed potatoes. Jesus goes to hell at his revivification, that is, at his resurrection, to go to hell and basically blow the big raspberry at the devil. You thought I was gone? Well, think again. Here's Jesus. Not Johnny. That's something else. Uh, here is Jesus. Um, and why does he do this? It's not for the benefit of hell. It is for the benefit of us. Hell holds no power because our King Messiah can go there and blow raspberries at the devil. Luther, by the way, is of the opinion that we get to mock the devil. This is the original source for Halloween, by the way. That we get to mock the devil and death and hell uh, as part of our faith, right? People think that Halloween is this imposition of demonic... Of course, it can be bent. Don't, don't misunderstand. Of course, it can be bent. But, but for Christians, Halloween has its own very good purposes to make fun of the devil. And Luther has some very humorous things to say about the ways in which you might mock the devil. And I think he's right. Uh, and C.S. Lewis picks this up, too. If you read his preface to the... Um, there, thank you very much. Screw tape letters. They're going to say the Chronicles of Narnia. Wrong guy. Uh, the screw tape letters, um, the introduction does make mention of Luther and uh, the opportunity to make fun of the devil. All right. Let me pause there. Questions about the exaltation. The first step is descent. So it's weird, right, because we think of it as going down to hell, and yet it's the first step in exaltation. It's a sign of his victory over our enemy. Wait. So you're saying that was before he physically, the right, before he probably. appeared, probably, right. So it's thought that sometime while it was still dark, I mean, this is purely speculative, but it's thought that sometime while it's still dark on Easter Sunday morning, um, and again, you have to understand that Sunday begins at, at sundown on Saturday, right? This is part of the, you have to keep this in mind. So before he comes out of the tomb, he goes, he descends to hell and basically says, I win, you lose, too bad for you. Or slings potatoes or whatever, you know, you know what I mean. All right. Mm. So did he proclaim the spirit Yes. Yes. So, uh, so uh, what you have to pay attention to is the verb to proclaim is sort of the most generic word for proclamation. The Bible much more often uses the term preach the gospel. So it's at the word gospel is in the verb. Here, that's not there. So the content of the proclamation is the victory of the Messiah over Satan, his kingdom, and everybody in it. Yeah, it's, yeah, correct. It's not a good... And in fact, I think King James actually translates preached to the spirits in prison. And, and that might have been somewhat misleading for people. Yeah, but it is actually proclaimed. Not, it's not preach the gospel. It was when Jesus showed up alive in hell. It wasn't a good idea for the devil, right? <laughs> this was bad news. Good news for us, right? There is a sense in which it is total gospel for us. You know, our enemy is so defeated 
that our king can go blow raspberries right in the center of his kingdom. Oh, sure. Yeah. Right. Doubly hopeless. Right. Sure. Exactly. Despair upon despair. Yeah. I don't want to go there. All right. Any other questions about the descent? All right. Moving on. Right. It is given for a man once to die and then the judgment. That's the writer to the Hebrews. Um, there are no second chances. Why? Because the first chance here is absolutely gratuitous. In other words, it's totally free. Again, you have to be the plumber in Matthew 22 who refuses the gift of the king and gets booted out of the out of the banquet hall, or you have to be one of the the um, foolish virgins, as we'll hear in the sermon today, uh, who uh, uh, not only fall asleep but are unprepared for the coming of the bridegroom, who is Christ, of course. Yeah. Uh, so the point here is, no one ever has to go to hell. No one. Right? Uh, and I'm getting ahead of myself. So we'll get more of that stuff when we get to the third article of the Creed, but that's a good question. Thank you. All right? Everybody ready to move on? All right. So as part of that exaltation, he ascends to heaven. Uh, the Gospels, of course, tell us this. Acts tells us this. What we get in Paul's Ephesians is kind of the theological upshot of the whole thing. And the, the first chapter of Ephesians is like two Greek periods. In other words, two Greek sentences. And it's so... It, it, when you want to really discombobulate the Greek student, you say, here, translate this. Anyway, so here we're sort of breaking into the middle of the sentence. What is the immeasurable, as you can see, it's sort of, anyway, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? So his is Christ, of course. According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ, sorry, it's the Father, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion, um, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but the one to come. And he has put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So at his ascension, he fills all things, and all things are comprehended or made complete in him. So you, you have sort of this overarching filling, but also that all things hold together in his own person. All right. Um, one, one word about this business of God's right hand, it's not three cubic meters to the right hand of the Father someplace out beyond the Milky Way. You have to remember that in the ancient world, right hand is sword hand. Left hand is shield hand. If you're a Roman legionary and switch hands, they take you out of the line and kill you. It's that simple. If you're left-handed, you'll learn to use your right. Because the left hand with the shield protects your neighbor and you, of course, and the right hand is the hand of attack. So whenever the Bible talks about the right hand of God, it's talking about God's power and activity in the world. It's not talking about a space out here, right? My pleasure. And, and there are Christians that think that because Christ is at the right hand of God, ergo he can't be correct, <laughs> which is an awful thought. Uh, and yet there are, American, there are European Christians that think precisely that. God, Jesus is stuck out there to the right hand of God someplace. yipity yo. All right. Yeah, 
Sure. The right-hand man. We actually use it that way, right? Um, I don't know about uh, the present incumbent of the British Crown, but at I, did I watch? I don't think I even watched his coronation. Uh, I think I watched bits and pieces, or I don't, doesn't matter. Anyway, so he gets two things. He gets the orb, and the holy hand grenade, right? The orb. That's what I said. And scepter, right? And pres I presume he gets the orb in his right, and scepter in his left. And I think they cross. Anyway, I don't know. But again, this is his power, right? Okay. You just stop. All right. He also sits at God's right hand. We've talked about what God's right hand is. Um, Matthew twenty six sixty four, and Jesus says this at the weakest moment in his ministry when he's arrested and standing before the high priest and the Sanhedrin. And he says to the high priest, I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. All right, so he has, uh, he has promised to return to bring judgment. Yes, Virginia, there is a judgment day. Okay. Let me pause there. Questions about his session, his seating at the right hand. How does it explain his coming supposedly at God's right hand and being at the right hand of God himself? Wherever two or more are gathered in my name, yeah. I am there also. Flow I'm with you always to the very end of the age, and so on. Right, exactly. How do you square that? It, well, it's, it's based on a very, very weak doctrine of the person of Christ, right? And what do you mean, what are you, what are you saying? Well, yeah, you, many Christians, again, follow the dictum that the finite is incapable of the infinite. That was a dictum of one of Luther's opponents. I won't go into the whole historical gory details. Um, but unfortunately... Many people who call themselves Christian actually believe this. You're kind of hard-pressed to find that dictum as a biblical truth. Why? The Word became flesh and dwelt for a while among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The incarnation itself destroys the dictum, the finite, the bodily, is incapable of the infinite, the divine. But a lot of them, especially American Christianity, presumes that dictum. It's not like you're going to find somebody saying you have to believe that, but they function with that presupposition. It, it's basically secularism applied to Christianity. How can you be a Christian and not believe in the Lord? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Well, the short answer to your question is you can't. You can call yourself whatever you like. Like, for example, I'm going to leave for the airport this morning in my Rolls Royce. I can call it what I like, but it don't make it no Rolls Royce, right? So, um, you know, names don't make things, especially not in our culture, right? We don't, we don't connect the name with the thing itself. And that's why now boys can be girls and girls can be boys and blah, 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 blah. It's nominalism, really. Um, and it's also, oh, let's not, let's get, <laughs> stop. All right. Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. But, yeah, okay. So let's just keep going, sorry. <laughs> he will come to judge. Um, St. Peter says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We heard that very thing in the gospel today, right? He's delayed until midnight, and then the cry comes out, the bridegroom is here. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works done on it will be exposed. So, I, again, I think of this as God withdrawing his providential hand from the universe that how he made the whole thing spin and relate and, you know, have all these gravitational pulls and so on, and then he simply removes his hand and all hell breaks loose, if you'll excuse the pun. 
Um, and, and then also what had been hidden up till now will be exposed. Okay? Let me just pause there. Yeah, yeah, should be. Nope, you won't. That's what I've been thinking about. Oh, I hope it's pretty obvious to me. I, I understand it's, it's time. Nope, right. I think I will figure that out. Well, so God actually promises that you will not miss it, right? He says, as the lightning appears from east to west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That's St. Matthew. So... And, and this is what kind of makes us chuckle from time to time. You have cults like, for example, Jehovah's Witnesses during, when would it be? I, I, I'd been, oh, I suppose a senior in high school. Um, and so in October 1976, they said, of course, Jesus was coming again. I forget the exact date, but obviously, well, er, he didn't. And so, you know, the result was, of course, that people gave large sums of money to the Jehovah's Witnesses. And when he didn't come, they said, well, wait, 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 well hang, hang on, what, what, well, he didn't come yet. What's the deal? And they said, he came. You just didn't notice. Well, the problem is the Bible says everybody will notice. They'll notice instantly. It will not come. I mean, it will be a surprise at the time. But for those of us who are believers, we'll go, hooray! And But nobody will miss it. Right, nobody will. Yes. So, if he continues to say he'll return, that everything happens around the time of the To him, right. 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 And so, it's that he continues to say he'll make his point when he returns, but I guess we can just believe the, the Gospels or whatever and keep the far line as could be. Right. Well, and, and the urgency has to always be there. Why do we do mission work? It doesn't matter where, wherever. In our own neighborhoods. Right? I mean, one of the most paganized communities in the world we happen to be living in. <laughs> right? We say, oh, let's help those pagans in Nigeria. I've been to Nigeria. Ah, there's a lot more pagans here, right? Um, so, so that's part of our thinking we have to be busy about sharing the gospel because we do not know the day or the hour. Um, we do want that ultimate rescue, though. Uh, who will rescue us from this present evil age, as St. Paul says at the beginning of Galatians. Uh, that's what we want, right? So it's a both end, yeah. And, of course, churches that no longer sort of believe like the second coming or the resurrection or whatever, have ceased to do anything like mission work. So we find ourselves in many cases alone on the mission field, whereas we used to be competing with, you name it. I mean, unfortunately, what, and I'll just give you one of the cases, the second or third largest Lutheran church in the world is in Madagascar. Who would have predicted that growing like crazy. Um, they were founded by the Norwegians. There's a long, it's a kind of cool story, but I won't bore you with it. Um, and the ELCA in America, of course, got involved, Lutheran World Federation. So now that liberal Lutheranism doesn't really believe anything much but the cultural verities, like it's okie-dokie to be homosexual, they start shoving that down the throat of these pious Madagascarian Lutheran Christians. And of course, what's attached to the shoving it down your throat? Dolares. Si, bueno. And you know what the Madagascarians said? The truth is much more valuable than dollars. Buzz off and they broke fellowship with the ELCA. Now, they're not in church fellowship with us, uh, you know, and maybe in my lifetime they may be, but, but 
I, I really appreciate these dear African Lutheran Christians who are no longer being cornered by liberal church organizations from the United States and Europe. God bless them. Yeah. In fact, I just, I, I don't know how this even happened. I got to be friends with the Archbishop of the Lutheran Church in Madagascar. His name is Dennis. I, I call him Dennis. Um, and, and he happened to be up in Fort Wayne this week while we were there for the Board of Regents meeting, so I got to see him again. And this guy wants his picture taken with me, right? I should want my picture taken with him. Um, so very kind, pious, faithful, confessionally correct people. You know, they're, they're growing like by 100,000 members a year. They put up a church, and, and within weeks, people are standing outside to hear the gospel proclaimed because there's not enough room inside. So they're hungry for what we think of as, uh, well, whatever, Jesus is all good, you know. We're, we're all doobie brothers, right? Jesus is just all right. All right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, the Madagascarians lived under a terrifying regime. I don't mean a political regime, but a regime where they were afraid of their ancestors. So, so basically, highly superstitious sort of context. The, Nor uh, the, Nor the Norwegians came and preached nothing but the first commandment. You can't worship your ancestors. There's only one God. And they kicked their butts and kicked their butts and kicked their butts and kicked. And finally, the Norwegians gave up and went home. Because nobody was paying any attention. So what happened was the Madagascarians discovered Jesus. <laughs> that Jesus died for me to free me from these demons. Oh, I get it now. And so without the Norwegians around, the Madagascarians start to proclaim Jesus as Savior. And so they just had an absolute explosion of their church's attendance because people are being freed from what weighs them down. In our culture, of course, you say sin to somebody and, and they say, that's not a weight. That's my pleasure. What are you talking about? Right, yeah, right, right, exactly. I, I'm old, so I say stupid things in elevators and in the grocery line, right? So, you know, you get into the grocery line and you watch the woman put like six bottles of wine. I will do the same thing, by the way, so it's not, you know, I'm not picking on somebody. Six bottles of wine on the, on the conveyor so that it can be, you know, and I just look at her and go, so we're following you home because we know where the party is, you know. Yeah, come on, you know. Oh, well, never mind. All right. And, and that's just one example. I mean, uh, um, you know, the, the Lutheran Church in Ethiopia is now the largest Lutheran Church body in the world. They've got a long way to go to um, Tanzania. It, and what's interesting is Tanzania is sort of coming our way. In fact, I met and was introduced to the bishop of the south, minute, southwestern diocese by Lake Victoria. Am I getting this right? Yeah. Um, and, of course, a lot of these people have been trained at our seminary. I mean, you want your dollar to go a long way? Support the seminary in its international outreach. Mine. <laughs> Concordia Theological yeah, Seminary. They, so my, the seminary I graduated from has, over the years, been extremely aggressive in helping our international partners. Or, in, in the case, of course, of some of these groups, like Ethiopia, we're not partners with them, but, but they want what we've got theologically. And our only trial is having the funded bodies to provide the training. That's the whole problem in a nutshell. You know, if we had another $20 million, whatever, we could do a lot more. Um, it's, it's not a question of will, because 
you know, when we get the money, we do it, right? So anyway, all right, let's keep going. Um, changing subjects, so that's humiliation and exaltation, right? So he goes down those steps, died, buried, you know, descended, uh, ascended, uh, sits, judges, all right? So that's the way it goes. I want to just pick one kind of narrow thing here, hopefully to give you some understanding, and that is atonement. Um, it is, you'll know it from all your Jewish friends, it is Yom Kippur, right? Um, Yom Kippur means day of covering, literally. Um, we've given it a highfalutin name, atonement. We'll kind of dispense with that. Um, the, the Hebrew word is basically CVR. Hebrew has no vowels which makes it a really fun language, <laughs> having learned it some time ago. So, um, so it's really kind of cool in a way. All you have to do is throw in the English vowels, O and E, and you get cover. Right? C-V-R. Right? So this happens in September, October. You know this from your Jewish friends, right? Uh, it's one of the high holy days. Um, and uh, now I'm putting you back before the hard building temple. I'm putting you into the tent of meeting, uh, which would have been used right through the time of David and into the time of Solomon. It was a movable feast, if you will. Um, the people um, uh, dragged it around with them and set it up wherever they stopped. God dwelt uh, between the cherubim, uh, during the wilderness wanderings, of course, as a pillar of cloud, by day a pillar of fire, by night. Um, on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement is the only day when the high priest is able to enter the most holy place or the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, there's a box. It's called the Ark. And it is basically the size of a casket, you know, where we put human remains for burial, a casket. Um, it's, it's almost exactly the dimensionality of Noah's ark, of course, scaled differently. And it's, by the way, also the dimensionality of the big uh, Japanese super tankers, only scaled differently, right? There's a reason for that. We figured out that that dimensionality is the most stable ocean-going vessel, okay? All right. So... In the ark, there are three things. This is our Bible quiz for today. What's in the ark? Not animals, different ark. Very good. The two tablets of the Ten Commandments, right? The second set, which God had to make because M Moses junked the first two. Right? Every once in a while, you see the funny cartoon where he drops the third tablet, right? And so we've missed a whole bunch of commandments. Um, so that's the first thing in the ark. What else? Aaron's staff, which uh, Moses uh, holds over the Red Sea to part it, um, with which he breaks open the rock to cause water to pour out, with which he parts the Jordan so that people can cross on dry ground and so on. Or at least Joshua did, sorry. But same staff. Um, there's a whole story to the staff that we haven't got time for now. Um, and what's the third thing? Manna, right, exactly. So there is a container of manna uh, to remind them of the wilderness wanderings, whereby God himself fed them and cared for them when they could not feed and care for themselves. This is, of course, what it means to be God, right? Okay. So um, what would happen, on, and I'm, I'm keeping it simple because there's a whole bunch of sacrifices on the Day of Atonement, but at one point the high priest will take the blood of the sacrifice who is slaughtered out here in the, in the court of the temple, and he will take a bowl uh, about this big, you know, like your Dorito bowl for, for Monday Night Football, um, and it's, it's brass, and it's filled up with blood from the victim. 
And he goes in. He's wearing, by the way, all of his regalia. This is the whole big dress-up day. Um, and what you have to remember is when the high priest wears the regalia, he is Israel in his person. Okay, so he's all dressed up as Israel. And he goes through here and parts the veil. So there is this line, this, this impenetrable veil. Um, we think of it as, as sheer, you know, like, like you put on your windows. It's not. It's like, for example, we know in Herod's temple, the, the, the woven veil, the catapetasma, is about this thick. It would have weighed tons and tons. So when that baby splits from top to bottom, not bottom to top, when Christ dies, it is a big stinking deal. All right. So the high priest goes in here with this blood, and he's got he's got a paintbrush. It's called um, hyssop branch, which is a, a flower. It's a weed that grows about this tall and has a big fluffy flower on it. A very stiff, um, uh, what would you say, stem. So they cut it off. And he puts it into the blood, which is still nice and warm and so on, and starts to smear it on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Let's just go to the next slide here because it will give us kind of the Ark Deco Ark. Of course, it's lost, right, no matter what, uh, no matter what um, Indiana Jones <laughs> says, right? Um, we don't know if it looked like that. I mean, it gives you kind of the, the, the general shape. So he goes in there and starts to spread the blood between the cherubim, especially on the top, but also on the sides of the thing. So it's a, if you'll excuse the term, bloody mess. If God is dwelling between the cherubim, what is the blood doing on the Ark of the Covenant? <laughs> Yeah, by by kind of uh, between him and not us, right? The law shows our sin, and so you get a blood covering. This is why it's called Yom Kippur or Kapar or Kafar. I mean, there's all kinds of forms of the Hebrew word uh, Kippur. Um, so it is day of covering, and the blood of the sacrifice covers the law so that God, who dwells above the cherubim, cannot see it any longer. How often does this happen? Yep, every year and 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 every year until it's stopped. What stopped it? There's two things to be said here. Right, so first of all, it stopped really a couple of times. Once, when the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem in 589, there we go, B.C. And then again, when the Romans come and destroy Jerusalem in 70 A.D. It's never been rebuilt, right? So there's no place for sacrifice. And that's why the Jews go to what they call the... Wailing Wall, right? Because at the Wailing Wall, they are about 40 meters west. Get the directions right, sorry. Yes, 40 meters west. I was there. 40 meters west of where that thing stood in the Temple of Herod. And they can't go any closer than that, right? Because they'll start riots. So they stand at that wall and they jam paper prayer intentions between the rocks because that's as close as they can get to the presence of God, according to them. Okay. All right. It's obvious that because it has to be repeated, it's not right, not permanent, it's not perfect, it's not complete. The sacrifice of the Day of Atonement points forward to one perfect sacrifice, which happens before the temple is destroyed, of course, in 33 AD. At, correct, the death of Jesus. 
Um, and he, uh, he then becomes what St. Paul calls the atonement cover in his blood. So he becomes the once and for all completion of the repeated sacrifices that could never do it completely. And he fulfills all of that in his person by covering our sin. Period. End of story. Mic drop. Okay. Um, the other interesting thing, of course, is that included in the Day of Atonement activities, the high priest came out, again, dressed in his regalia. This is after the, the blood sacrifices are offered. And takes two goats, um, one of which they slaughter, the other of which the high priest puts his hand on the goat's head and confesses the sins of Israel. What happens to that goat? Hmm? It's released. Where? Outside the camp, right? So you take the goat and chase it away. What's happening to sin? It's going away, carried by, ah, voila, now we got the word, the scapegoat. And we still have that phrase in our culture, and we misuse it, because there is only one proper scapegoat, and it is Christ, who bears the sins of the people, is taken out of the camp, remember his cross is outside the walls of Jerusalem, and your sin does it come back? Nope. It's gone. He is the scapegoat. All right. So those are a couple of things. And, of course, the New Testament's using all, especially the language of atonement, um, to refer to the person and work of Christ. And so in that sense, I know your Jewish friends don't want to hear this, we're, we're supersessionists. That is, we supersede Judaism. We certainly love the Jews. We agree that they received the oracles of God. But those oracles point forward to the person and work of Jesus. And we want them also to believe that same Messiah that we believe. Right? Um, all right. And again, our liberal friends, liberal Christians, think we're nutty for being supersessionists. But that's... If you take the Bible seriously, you have no choice. Sure, right. That's medieval writing, period. Yeah. I, you know, yeah. saying Luther is the cause of the Holocaust is like saying St. Augustine is the cause of the internal combustion engine. <laughs> probably not, right? That's probably historical reading in. And honestly, it's not like there's a whole bunch of stuff in Mein Kampf quoting Luther, right? I mean, so you have to remember that. Um, all right. So I want to just go on and make some conclusions. The teaching of the atonement, Christ has redeemed us from the guilt and curse of sin. If you just read one bit of Luther, read his commentary on Galatians 3.13. Um, Paul says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So he becomes the criminal, the sinner, the derelict, the reject, and, and takes all of that into his person, carries it to the cross of Calvary, and dies there. His death is not primarily painful in a physical way. It is painful in a physical way, but that's small potatoes in comparison to the spiritual burden that Jesus bore 
by taking your sins into his own person and carrying it to the cross of Calvary and becoming that derelict. Um, and if that curse is on the one who, who hung on a tree, can it be any longer on us? No, right? Uh, we have the doctrine of no double jeopardy in law because the Bible has the doctrine of no double jeopardy in law, right? So once we get rid of the Bible, folks, double jeopardy probably comes back in vogue. Just, just warning you. Um, all right. And, and notice, too, this talk of redeeming. It's buying us back from what? From a curse. Um, why? Because he becomes cursed for us by having the... Oh, yeah, I mean... He didn't cause it. I mean, again, this is his incredible. It's so easy for us to say, well, it's not my fault. Right? He could have said that. You know, uh, you know, the father comes and says, son, we've got to do something for them. Oh, come on, dad. They did it to themselves. Right? This is just like kids would say to their parents. Right? Go help your brother. Well, he made the mess of his own room. <laughs> right? But, of course, Jesus says, Yes, Father, right willingly, I will go. Because I want them. They're mine too, right? So he loves us and will do this for us. All right. Uh, Christ has redeemed us from the fear and bitterness of death. We've seen this first, uh, 2 Timothy 1.10. Our Savior Christ Jesus abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's why we preach the gospel because we're making you deathless. We're making you true Athanasians. Athanasius, of course, means deathless one. Uh, Christ has redeemed us from the power of the devil. I will put enmity between you and the woman. This is our Father speaking to Adam and Eve. And between your offspring and her offspring, he... That is, her offspring shall bruise your head, and you, the Satan, shall bruise his heel. So Christ comes as the child of Mary, and he defeats the serpent. Um, again, if you've seen, um, what's his name? Um, thank you, Mel Gibson. I never can remember the guy's name in that awful. Uh, um, uh, Passion of the Christ. Right at the beginning, he crushes the head of the serpent. And I had trouble kind of watching the movie, but once he did that, it helped me out, right? I was able to watch it. Um, this may be the most radical statement ever made in the history of anything, humanity or otherwise. Um, it's my favorite Pauline statement, in other words, a statement of Paul. Um, and it rates right up there with John 1.14, the word became flesh. All right. For our sake, he made him, God our Father, made him Christ to be, to be sin who knew no sin. And notice how powerful the words are here. It isn't like, oh, he just sort of took your sin on. Oh, no. He becomes it. So intimately does that does your sin become his, that he becomes it. Uh, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's the great exchange which the Bible talks about. He, the Holy One, becomes the sinner. We, the sinners, become the Holy Ones. That's the trade-off. And, you know, today, of course, in that gospel lesson, we hear of the bridegroom, Christ, and so on. And, and you know, our, our wedding traditions are, are probably becoming less and less connected to the Bible's worldview. Big surprise there. Um, but in, in ancient times, of course, when man and woman married, what belonged to the woman became the man's, and whatever be, belonged to the man also became the woman's. So there, there was this great exchange. Well, Christ is the bridegroom. When he marries us, he takes our filth, our sin, our depravity, all of that, and takes it away. 
and his pristine holiness, righteousness, and all that becomes ours by faith. So, um, so it's a pretty good deal. When he comes along and says, I'd like to marry you, you say, pick me, pick me, right? Because I, I really want what you've got. All right, let me just pause there. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Joanna. Right. Right, right. Right, right. My finances were a mess when I got married, and my wife helped me out with that. All right. Um, we're going to break off there. Um, we'll, get to, um, we'll get to Matthew 22 next week. 12, 7, 19. Yes, we'll be here. I'll be here. Um, we do have a guest, uh, the president of our seminary in St. Louis. Um, I think it's called Concordia Seminary. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and, and he'll be preaching. And, but I think we'll still have our class because we're... You know, we need to kind of keep going or we're, we'll get bogged down. Uh, so I'll introduce him at the beginning, and then I'll let him go, and then we'll get, we'll get together here. Yeah? Is that okay? All right. My pleasure. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, how gracious you are to us, unaccountably so. Though we have in no way merited what you grant to us, you come to us and take all that is weak, broken, uh, sinful, depraved within us, and you slather yourself with such depravity to take it away in your own person, to take it to the cross and there put it to death. Help us to walk to Calvary's hill with you that we might see our sin there, dead, gone, taken away. Help us then to live in peace and joy, knowing that our sin cannot uh, uh, swallow us, cannot uh, take us away from you, uh, cannot defeat us because you have long ago swallowed it, taken care of it, and defeated it. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. All right, we'll see you next week. Thank you very much. They never let me fly the plane, so it's all good. <laughs>